Welcome to another interview with one of our 2021 world's competitors. I'm Andrew Beckstrom, and today I am joined by Mark Colico. And uh, you know, we, one of our normal questions, Mark, when we do these interviews with our world's competitors, is where your, the origins of your username in game. But uh, seeing your last name now for the first time, I think it's become a little more clear. But how do we get from Colico to Colacoma? So um, it was actually my college like assigned id was just my last name first two letters of my first name so colosso ma turned into colacoma and oh, i thought okay. yeah, uh it sounds sounds like something so go with it <laughs> well we, i've been myself and everyone on the team we've seen your deck list for years and you've always been uh colacoma how, how if people at home wanted to pronounce your in-game username the way the way that you like it how do you like it sounding sure uh, colacoma it rolls off the tongue more it really does all right mark well thanks for joining us today so as i mentioned you are one of our 2021 world's competitors uh you are notable in that you are the first one to qualify by not winning a tournament. <laughs> yeah. how, how does that feel? How does that distinction feel? <laughs> so I really like the rule change, obviously, because I got advantage from it, but also it makes uh, coming in top four a lot less of a feel bad that you were this close. Now, um, you know, top 16, you're in the LCS, top eight, you're getting paid, top four, you're getting a chance to worlds and, you know, obviously top two top one it's even closer so every level feels more important with these new rule set i really like it so taking a step back uh for the people at home why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and sort of who are you and what what do you do when you're not playing eternal sure so um i'm a long time gamer i started playing magic around the dark in the mid 90s and played through the early 2000s, at which point I started medical school and all my time kind of got eaten up by that. I just a couple of weeks ago finished my last post-medical school training year. It's um, what I do. I'm a pediatric surgeon, so it takes eight years of training after medical school between residency and fellowship. And I just finished that. I just moved to um, um a new old city the city where i had done residency i came back for a full-time position so um my life's kind of <laughs> getting tossed up with moving and uh, applying for licenses and all that um outside of that i am also a partner and co-owner of a virtual reality arcade in greensboro north carolina with a fellow um miss play member i also i play with team misplay. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, Canada. So if anybody's ever in Greensboro, check us out at uh, Dimensional Drop. Mention Eternal, we'll give you a discount or something. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, you mentioned the misplay and um, yeah, and what, sounds like a great time to to plug that. What For those at home who don't know, what is the misplay? So the misplay started with the podcast, uh, Parmalee and Gato Studio and uh, later Soap Yellow, um, they put together a very entertaining podcast and they kind of branched it out to uh, a team and the Discord. And it really, um, you know, it's a good group of guys, they're a good group of people to hang out with, discuss the game. Um, it's got a little bit of something for everyone, competitive, new players. Website has a little bit of, um, you know, written, um, articles on the game too. So a little bit of something for everyone. I should also mention the misplay does um, a weekly meta report where um, teammates as well as you know non-teammates who are wanting to contribute uh, track their games and uh, what matchups they play. And um, we kind of put out a percentage of uh, different decks that you might expect to see as well as some um, popular lists from Eternal War Cry of those different decks to kind of get people who are um, still learning the format, something that they know has been tried and true and they could try out and play. Do you recall uh, the first time that you were introduced to Eternal, the first card that you saw or maybe really jumped out to you? So I would say it was uh, Oni Ronin and more specifically War Cry. 
something I really liked about Eternal starting out and even now, a lot of digital card games, they kind of rely on randomness as their selling point versus, you know, paper card games, they could do random stuff. But I really like that Eternal focused on other areas that couldn't work in paper, but weren't random. Like random, it's sure it's fun for games, but when you're, you want to play competitive, you want less randomness, but things like Warcry or Echo or Fate, they're all effects that couldn't work in paper, but um, weren't random. So I really like those kinds of effects and that's what really first drew me to the game. Totally. Uh, so as an Eternal player now, what is your, what's your favorite format at the moment? So I would always say draft. Um, I don't think I'm as good a draft player as I am a constructed player, but I just, uh, any game, I've always found draft to be more fun. There's a lot more going on. There's, it, it's a lot harder to play when you're not just playing the best cards. It's figuring <laughs> out what medium stuff you have to play and uh, getting there with it. Do you have a favorite deck all, of all time that you built or played? Um, Reanimator. Um, when I qualified for last year's world, it was uh, with um, Felm Reanimator, and it was a lot of fun because me and um, fellow um, Miss Play member, but also high school buddy of mine, I'm so bad, played in the finals, um, Felm versus Felm, and this was right after Fellow Rock came out, so it was like, I Fellow Rock, you're Fellow Rock. <laughs> No, I fell rock here, fell rock back. Fell rock was broken then and was broken up till a couple of weeks ago. So um, I really, I really loved playing that deck. And you know, the the first, um, the throne open that I top four it at, I played, it was more of a rampy style of um, reanimator with uh, Xenon and um, the bow and hourglass combo to get power out and Katra to um ramp up but it still went to big var and just play out your whole void so the animators always felt like something that's you know super strong and um throne is about bringing the most broken stuff you can so so yeah you mentioned your throne run and uh you know are stretching your memory a little bit because it's been a little bit since that tournament but you mentioned you played xenon ramp with all of the the uh, xenon ramp reanimator and uh do you, so what do you recall what went into sort of getting that deck together for that tournament what your preparation was like uh sure so i was you know tooling around with it and it felt close but not good enough and then um Pyrese actually came in, up with the idea of uh splashing primal and playing uh grenahan because it felt like the deck was missing an enabler and Grenahan with the ability, it was also even. Um, <laughs> Grenahan had the, you know, it would very often draw you a card and toss one to two power into your void that you could later get back. And um, at first I was, I felt like it was too much of a stretch, but between paintings and you already playing vows, it was easy to play one primal sigil. Um, they, they, they were basically free and it really helped the deck play out a lot better. So it went from Zine in to Zine Hen. And <laughs> that's what we ran. And it felt, you know, the the big popular deck was um the the Feln even decks. And this deck wanted to get Fell Rocks. So, like I was happy when my opponents played Fell Rocks against me. <laughs> so um it felt really good into the format. And so Normally, normally when we do these interviews, like we mentioned, we get to talk about how you won the tournament, but this tournament sort of got you half of your world's qualification. What ultimately knocked you out in this one? So as much as I felt it was a great matchup, I lost to the boxer, who's also a great player, playing the, the film even. Totally misplayed in the <laughs> top four, true to the team name. Um, you know, not to make excuses, but I was also on call and dealing with the situation in the hospital while playing. So you know, it was kind of, um, uh, I, my head wasn't in it as much as I, it should have been, but you know, no, not to take anything away from the boxer. He's an excellent player. Yeah. I, I think you probably prioritized right though. <laughs> it sounds like ultimately you were able to complete your qualification requirements by getting a second top four finish 
at the Empire of Glass 5K draft open. And so it's the first time that we've sort of run a entire draft tournament. Um, and so obviously you've played in a lot of our tournaments before, sort of what went in for you in terms of getting ready for, for this one? So um, a couple nights before the event, we kind of had a team meeting. Uh, D-Dub put together all the data over um, you know, what people thought were the best cards, um, what people were doing well with from you know, our seven win um, decks. And we kind of, basically everyone uh, this felt that Basher was a key card to the format, Barricade Basher. And your decks either had to play bash or be able to deal with the turn three basher. From this data, I kind of looked at it and um, came up with this is what I want to play. And my top 64 deck was a basher deck, but also had, I think, three Watchwings supports and two munitions. So everything I played was just huge. And it, I think I didn't lose a game with that deck. And then the top, uh, the, top eight i was like oh i just need one one win with this deck <laughs> and martial efficiency was enough to carry me there did you do anything to celebrate uh obviously sounds like you had some teammates that helped you out along the way what was your reaction like when you got that win oh man it was great i eh? i was really happy to get it because my top four game i was never in but i at that point i was like oh i don't care <laughs> we're, we're 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 past that last year getting to worlds felt almost a little bit like a, a fluke playing the right thing at the right time this year it felt you know and to do it in two tournaments it felt like i had to work for a little bit more to get there do you anticipate you'll be playing more of the tournaments or is this a good chance for you to take a break before the build up to worlds where, where is, where's your head at these days so I like competing. I'm certainly going to play in as many of the tournaments as I can. And, um, you know, as I get more senior in my career, the less call I have to take. So it's the less weekends I'm busy. Um, so I think I'll make most of them. Really, though, my goal at this point now is just to, you know, help friends and whatnot get good finishes and potentially into worlds as well. What sort of things are you looking for in your games and focusing on when you're trying to get your play and your deck to sort of that next level where it can compete in a tournament? So I actually think um, more important than playing is watching other people play. I would say that the week before an open, I probably spend more time spectating than I do actually playing. I think, you know, you want to watch people of a variety of skill levels, both people you consider better than yourself and people on par or weaker than yourself. And you want to, you know, when they make a play that you don't necessarily agree with, you either figure out why they made that play and if it makes logical sense. And if you still can't, ask them, you know, what were your thoughts there? And sometimes they'll be like, oh, I just, uh, I wasn't paying attention, I did this. But sometimes they had a, a line that you didn't realize and, you know, maybe their line was better. Maybe they're more familiar with the deck. You've mentioned uh, the misplay. Um, what sort of resources does the misplay provide that can help players who are looking to get better? So we just did a, um, a series where um, for expedition with the new expedition, playing budget decks and getting to masters with that. And uh, a couple of people did with a couple different lists. So I think that's a you know good place to start. Um, there's a lot of great streamers, um, you know, too many to name. And most of them, if you, you know, asking questions, don't feel you're like you're gonna sound stupid because you're new and you don't, you know, you don't know what's going on. You only learn by asking questions. Just out of curiosity, is that a is that something that like you picked up from your medical education background? I imagine it's pretty good in that field to not act like you know something you don't know. Yeah. And when performing surgery, even when I have uh, someone, you know, junior to me doing the case with me, I'll often be like, hey, do you think this looks right to you? Maybe either something as simple as them being on the other side of the table for me and having a different vantage point, they might see something I don't. Um, it's like the worst complications I've ever seen have been people who are just um, too, um, too proud to uh, admit that they uh, 
they didn't know what was going on or they didn't like how something looks. So there's there's no shame ever in asking, you know, and even if it's just like, oh, you know, we're doing this because this. Okay, that's fine. It's real quick. And now you know. I think that's great advice. I definitely, um, in my in my own uh, less technical education um, in the world of game design, have definitely found that to be true as well. A different set of eyes is always just such a valuable thing and something you can only get from somebody else. You only see the world through your own. Absolutely. Turning it back to some of your in like your personal preferences in Eternal. We talked about your favorite deck uh, earlier. Uh, do you have an all-time favorite card uh, just for sort of what it does in the game? And then after, let's hear about your favorite uh, card art. So again, I would have said Felrock until he he got the Nerf Hammer. So at this point, I'd probably say Grasping at the Shadows. I still, I love the animator. I love just the style of play it. And, um, between that and Big Vera, I think those cards are still the linchpins of the deck. Um, in terms of my favorite art, I would say the premium version of Harsh Rule, because I, I really like um, how the cards tell the, the story and the lore. And it's uh, even harder in a game like Eternal, where there's no uh, flavor text. But the harsh rule, you, you know, you see Roland setting off his explosion, which, you know, spoilers for people who haven't uh, followed any of the lore, is a big story <laughs> moment. And um, if you haven't it, gone through the campaign, it's a banger. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, usually I could give or take uh, premium, but this premium, instead of just, you know, a foiling, it has like all the rubble flying through the air. So it really, I think, adds to the art. So, um, yeah, that's that's my favorite. Do you have a, a, a pet card? Like, you you mentioned you liked playing Felrock because it was broken. Is there a bad card or a card you don't think is particularly strong, but it somehow keeps finding its way into your bruise? Uh, Crystalline Chalice. Because, <laughs> um, you know, when I, I first started playing in the uh, open beta, that was the first, like, competitive deck I net decked. And it was a lot of fun, super grindy, generating card advantage. Um, you know, every time it shows up in Expedition, I'm like, oh, maybe it's good enough again. Do you have a favorite tribe in the game? Is there is there a type that you are particularly attached to? So, and I know most people are going to hate this answer, <laughs> but I really like strangers and I really liked um, the expedition where it was a lot of stranger mirrors, like a lot of people just hate that matchup, but I think it's super, super skill intensive trying to figure out what you're playing when and how it's going to affect, you know, you're not only thinking about your board, but your opponent's board. So, um, a little bit painful to play, but again, super skill intensive. And I think it creates a lot of very interesting games. Is there a card in the game that sort of always has your number, but doesn't even have to be one of the best cards, but just something where it's like, oh, my Bruce never beat this one? No crust Yeti. Because when I, <laughs> usually when I build decks, I'm like, now nah, just you lose to Yetis and hope to dodge it. <laughs> and then like when they play it, I'm like, oh, I guess I lose because everything I do, dirt will turtles too much if we were gonna do a, a live balance change to a card in the game and you got to change one card what would you want to change and why i'd probably change Bellrock back i don't <laughs> think he would i i guess he was pretty op maybe maybe change it to cost one to activate instead of two mm. all right well, well we'll see we'll see about that one do you have a favorite faction uh i like primal i like to generally kind of sit and accumulate advantage it's it's interesting in this game that primal is both like the card advantage slow but also has yetis which is the fastest thing you could be doing so but I, i'm more on the you know slow methodical build my hand kind of side slow and methodical that's what i want my surgeon to be all <laughs> right uh if you could have a battle skill irl what would it be um i would say renown because, you know, capable of greatness, but needs some support to get there. Yep. Renowned Surgeon has a good ring to it. All right. <laughs> if you could have any card become an alternate art, uh, what would it be? And what would you like to see on that art? Um, I would probably, Grasping in Shadows have, you know, 
I don't know how you would change it. Maybe having, you know, something like shooting out of the grave or something like that. Something really old school the animator kind of artwork. Looking to the future, you've got the world championships coming up. Uh, do you have any goals in mind? Is it, you know, it's you made it last year. Um, going this year is it important for you to win or are you sort of the mindset more i'm just going to compete and what happens happens um yeah i'm i'm really just happy to be here uh last uh, last year i made it to day two which was top 16 so i'd like to make it to top eight but again i'm just i'm just happy to be playing before we go let's get into if you have any questions you want to ask me about the game uh try to give this as an opportunity uh and I will do my best uh, to answer them without getting in trouble with anybody. <laughs> sure. And I actually sourced these from our, our Discord, so you know, got some community. Oh, questions so I got the you. I got I got a handle from a whole Discord. All right, <laughs> let's. <laughs> um, so you know, I know you guys have a lot of different things you work on at uh, Dire Wolf. How much of the developers' time is like develop? Um, dedicated to eternal versus your other board game projects and whatnot yeah um so mo for the most part the people who work on eternal um they, they pretty much do it full time um the designers who are on that and um what we try to take advantage of is that at various stages of projects um people get brought in for play tests and so it's nice that we have um people that we can bring in um that are you know, seasoned designers have a good sense of these things, but yet aren't in the weeds. They get to just experience it as somebody who's just experiencing it fresh. There's always a different sort of angle that you get when you see uh, when you see how the sausage is made, so to speak. And occasionally people move projects and that could be nice too, because, you know, you're working on something for a while. And um, even we also want that fresh experience of, oh, this person hasn't been working on Eternal for a while and now they are again. And what do they, what do they think? What do they think could be a, a good a good idea for a new direction to take our next set all those sorts of things there have been you know cards throughout eternals history that were nerfed in eras when they were probably too strong but nowadays would you know probably be fine at their original costs or original abilities whatever has there been any thought about going back and undoing some of the nerfs of these older nerfed cards yeah so a lot of times we do and and in the and we have um, certain cards. Some cards uh, have gotten unnerfed over time, and it's something we're always um, when we're revisiting uh, balance changes. We're always looking at. Uh, sometimes uh, the case is is that cards are changed and nerfed not just because uh, we that our assessment of the situation was that things would be more fun if this card was a little bit less strong overall. But sometimes we also notice an aspect of a play pattern of the card that we found um you know potential pretty challenging to balance around and so we can uh potentially make the card better but also different than it was originally that's sort of the angle that we're looking at when we are doing nerfs is both how do we improve how this card plays while also making the world more fun and similarly if we're going to rebuff an old card um you know for instance uh predatory carnosaur was a card where we sort of fiddled around the edges a little bit. We're trying to fine tune that one just right with its cost and stats. It's it's gone bounced up and down a little bit, but we're trying to get into a, a spot where it answers things, but isn't uh, too much where it it's um, oppressive to people who are playing with a certain kind of unit. Are there any thoughts about changing the UI or the interface or adding things like tournament, uh, community tournaments? I'm sure the TNE team would love to have an in-client system for something like that. The usual thing that I it, preamble I have to give whenever I'm asked questions of this kind is, I am never the person who gets to announce things. Um, so don't, no, so don't, don't, nobody should expect that coming here. Um, but we absolutely are both, both agree and pay attention to when we see Reddit posts and Discord comments about things along the nature of some of those features that you just named. And it is something that uh, is getting gets a lot of consideration that as we sort of figure out where to uh, where where to where we can best improve the game. Last question: um, Are there any plans to 
uh, revisit previous events? Definitely. Um, when we rerun events, we do get a feedback from some users who are happy to see this event come back. And we also get feedback from some people who are, uh, who are like, oh man, I wanted to see something new. Definitely um, a case where it's a, it's, a, it's a tough balance that we're always striving for because we want to be able to make both groups happy. Is there, is there a particular event that comes to mind for you that we ran that you'd like to see come back? I mean, I, I always love Commander, so the hero format I found really fun. Honestly, if, if there was a way to work that into the game to just play you know, with your friends whenever, I think that'd be great. Yeah, yeah. Def definitely uh, an area of interest for us is how we can facilitate more of those sort of like casual uh, styles of gameplay that a little more social, obviously a little bit harder just with a digital card game than when it's uh, you could sit down across somebody at a table. But we, we definitely know that it's uh, it's a pretty awesome way to play games like this. With that, we're going to throw it back to the booth now. But thanks once again, Mark, for joining us. Do you have any parting words? Uh, no. Thanks. Thank you for having me. And you know, everybody watching, if you don't check out the, the Misplay podcast, give it a listen, join our Discord. Um, it's always a good time. All right. Thanks a lot, Mark.